I come to conferences like this one, some of my most productive time is spent in hotel bars. <laughs> one of my areas of research is charter schools and school choice. And I'll often go out for a beer, and one night I might go out with folks who are generally identified as being on the pro-charter side, and the next night I might go out with folks who are seen as being on the critical of charter side. And whichever group it is, the discussions we have usually do focus on the research in the field, and they're sophisticated discussions that focus on the strengths and the limitations of the research on both sides of the debate. So it's been a puzzle to me why occasionally, not long after that, I would see research by these same scholars or the scholars themselves making statements that seemed much more assertive, much simpler, uh, much more distinct from one another than what uh, I had heard from them in these conversations. And reflecting on that actually led to a, something of an inflection in my career, whereas previously I had been doing research on charter schools, I began to do research on the research on charter schools, and in particular on how research moves from uh, acad academia into the public sphere. And it's based on that that I have three points that I want to uh, discuss today. So first, on high-profile debates, particularly debates that are partisan and ideological in nature, um, research is often used more as a political weapon than as a tool of illumination. When the debates are polarized, as many debates are, as you know, in national uh, sphere these days. The research is often pulled out to the polls, and the researchers themselves are sometimes pulled out to the polls as well. And the result, rather than a nuanced and sophisticated discussion, is often a fairly nasty and personalized one. I was very struck uh, back in the late 90s when some of the early research was coming out on vouchers in Milwaukee. There was a front page story in the Wall Street Journal featuring two prominent researchers with their pictures on the front of the Wall Street Journal and where I might have naively hoped that this would have been a chance for an article that delved into the complications of what we knew and didn't know at the time. Instead, it devolved into almost like a catfight. Uh, one researcher called the other one a snake. And the second researcher said the first one's research was lousy. Now, I get concerned about this because I worry that to the extent research comes to be seen as just another weapon, as just another venue for the engagement of these ideological debates, audiences we care about, the public, foundations, policymakers will be disenchanted, turn off. As someone I interviewed said to me, oh, these scholars, these social scientists, piddling about this and piddling about that, um, a pox on all your houses. <laughs> now, I, that's unfortunate because my argument is in less visible arenas, the research in general, and the research even on a hot topic like charter schools has, is resilient, has progressed, um, and has led to greater understanding of a phenomenon that early on no one really had a handle on. Early on in any policy arena, research tends to be weak, the measures are weak, people haven't developed meaningful typologies of the phenomenon they're uh, considering, the research designs are crude, uh, studies are done in just one place and no one knows how to generalize from those. But the research tends to have a trajectory and it's a trajectory with uh, ebbs and flows but it's a trajectory that often uh, converges to some extent. And that's what's happened, I would argue, in, in school choice. The research has converged not, I hasten to add, to a point of consensus by any means. But, uh, but the research has tended to um, discredit some of the extreme uh, predictions, both by the 
proponents of charters and the critics of uh, charters. We know more, in any event, about charter schools now from the research. Now, I think part of the explanation for what's going on is that we as researchers are not the ones who carry the research into the public sphere. We're dependent on others, we're dependent on the media, we're dependent on foundations, we're dependent on various kinds of intermediary groups, advocacy organizations, organizations whose task it is to distill the research. And those organizations vary in their capacity and to some extent in their will to really seriously scour the existing research and discover where the body of evidence at any point lies. And even those organizations that are really trying hard and sincerely to do this uh, have their own organizational missions. They have their own organizational pressures that can lead them to be selective in what they bring attention to, that can lead them to oversimplify their story, and that can lead them to attach the research to policy recommendations that aren't necessarily supported by the research. So what can we do about this? I do think that we as a broad community have some responsibility to play a act, more active role, to engage in this. That may mean being the communicators of our research in some instances. In other instances, it may mean being a check on the intermediary groups, those middleman groups, that, um, uh, so that we can eliminate uh, or challenge uh, claims that are unsupported. And in general, I think we need a more dialogue and in some instances, partnership with policymakers and practitioners to pursue that. Now, I do have two caveats uh, that I want to offer. One is that we not get pulled ourselves in the effort to communicate with these broader audiences into a simplistic presentation of the field. We all know as researchers that research is messy, that no study is perfect, um, that most of the time our findings are uh, couched in uncertainty and probability. The audience may not want to hear that, and it may be hard to communicate that in a way that's clear, but I think we do have an obligation to try to make sure that the complications of what we do is communicated as well as, uh, as, as the forum allows. Second caveat, um, while I think there are good arguments for working more closely with policymakers, with practitioners, even in terms of co-constructing to some extent our research agenda, it's also the case that we as a community have an important social role as an objective and sometimes critical observer of what goes on. So what I do want to make sure that we attend to in the process is that we don't, as partners, end up as junior partners essentially supporting uh, uh, the, uh, those who are in positions of power and authority at a particular point in time. Now, how do you thread the needle on these things? I have some ideas about what that might look like. I think many of you probably have ideas about what that might look like, and if you want to talk about them, I'll meet you in the hotel bar. <laughs> Thanks.